All right. So speaking of which, uh, I'd like to kick off by introducing Karim Harbert. So I've known Karim for quite a few years. I guess I've been to a lot of scrum gatherings and, and see him at the European scrum gatherings uh, each year I've been. And yeah, Karim's one of these high achievers in the Scrum and Agile community. Uh, it's the sort of person that uh, every time I meet him, he's got some new thing under his belt, whether it's a new training certification or starting a company, Agile Center, or uh, you know, writing a book now. <laughs> but also he's on the, uh, the board of Scrum Alliance. And uh, yeah, really a, a pretty major person to, to know in our Scrum community and uh, a lot to offer, a lot to, a lot to learn from Karim, I think. Uh, so he is a certified scrum trainer like myself, but does uh, a lot of work with uh, a lot of interesting people around the world and uh, very well connected in the Agile community. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Karim. Would you like to put your hands together and welcome Karim from London. Thank you so much, Rowan. A nice, kind introduction there, um, and uh, and thank you for for having me on as well. I, I appreciate that. I've, uh, I, I tend to uh, stick to Europe with these meetups, so this is my first uh, my first session uh, down under. So I'm delighted to be here with you all. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, run through. Uh, I've got some slides because on Zoom, you know, you probably you're probably going to get bored of looking at my face on your screen. So I'll show you something a bit more interesting to look at as we go. Talk for about 45 minutes and let me set my timer because it's been known for me to bust my time box. You'd never know I spent years as a scrum master, um, but I do bust my time box every now and then. So I'll do my best to keep it snappy and, uh, and keep things moving. So uh, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. It looks like you can because I'm looking at what you're looking at over there. Uh, you should be seeing my grinning face um, uh, on a purple background there. Fabulous. Um, so let's dive straight in. Um, this is going to be uh, called the six enablers of business agility. And what we're going to be covering in the next 45 minutes or so is high level three things. We're going to look at the case for business agility and what business agility is, because there's no universal definition. This will be my definition um, and why it's important, why we need to care about this. Then we'll introduce the six enablers of business agility, what they are, why those six, why not other things that people often say, what about the, um, I'll talk about that, how that came about. Um, and then uh, the third one here is a bit, is a bit dubious because what I'm not going to do is uh, talk to you about how to set the transformation up for success because um, in the kind of six or seven minutes I give it, that would be impossible. Um, what I will do is talk about some high level patterns, some high level challenges I've seen over the years on many failed transformations, some successful ones, and how I think we can prevent some of those issues going forward at a super high level. All right, so this is just an overview. So that's gonna be the, uh, the three high level topics we cover. Um, so yes, this is me. Uh, as, as Rowan said, I've been I've been around in the agile space since about two thousand and eight nine ish. I was a software engineer, project manager before that, traditional project manager, PMP, all that good stuff. Um, I, I do my Scrum was my introduction to agile back in the day, and I was a Scrum master uh, for five or six years from about two thousand and eight, uh, and I've been sort of an agile coach and trainer ever since, uh, focusing largely in the business agility space. Uh, so uh, that's where I am now. That's what I'm passionate about. But I've never forgotten my scrum roots and I still do uh, work with scrum teams as well. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about woolly mammoths, because why not? Um, now, uh, if we go back um, like thousands, tens of thousands of years, millions of years, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, Animals get bigger and bigger over time through a process of natural selection. Um, I'm told uh, if you go back far enough, um, uh, there was a two-ton wombat that used to lumber around the outback of, of your good country. And uh, there are uh, the woolly mammoths, of course. I recently, uh, just in my local park, went yesterday with, with, my, uh, with my little girls and uh, uh, there was a I kind of a, a, a Brachiosaurus, which is one of the tallest animals to ever live, not a real one, obviously. Um, one of the tallest animals at, uh, at 12 meters high and 30,000 kilograms, 30 tons, uh, metric tons, right? These enormous large scale animals, but they got bigger and bigger over time, particularly mammals and reptiles, because there's a competitive advantage 
when the climate and the environment is stable to being big. And if you think about that advantage, uh, when you're squaring up against others in your species, the bigger and the stronger one tends to prevail there, fighting for resources. If you're a predator, you're more able to catch your prey if you're bigger and stronger. Uh, and if you are trying to fight off predators, again, uh, you don't see too many leopards uh, taking out elephants uh, because the elephant's just a bit too big and strong for them. So being bigger is going to help you there, not to mention having more access to resources if you can travel further distances and to be able to store more resources so that you can survive the lean times. In short, the, the, the natural selection process leads over time to us getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And four million years ago, our ancestors were about four foot high. Um, we're mostly bigger than that now. All right, so there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. So you may then ask the question, and it's a reasonable one, well, where are these giant creatures now? Let's ignore whales because they're underwater and that's cheating. Um, uh, on land, we don't see too many giant animals now, not really that much bigger than the elephant, which is about five, um, I don't know, five tons or so, right? But we don't tend to get that much bigger than that. So where have they all gone? Well, nature's clever because nature has built in a counterbalance and that counterbalance comes in the form of extinction events. The most famous of which, of course, being uh, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event of 66 million years ago. And what happened there? An asteroid slammed into round about the Gulf of Mexico, set up a chain of events that wiped out 75% of life on the planet. That's plants and animals, just gone. Now, the interesting thing from that period is that those that survived were almost exclusively the smaller creatures, cat sized and below, but almost nothing over 25 kilograms survived. That's 55 pounds to anyone who still works in that. Uh, uh, sometimes we get Americans on, they don't understand kilograms. Um, all right, but uh, uh, nothing big managed to survive that impact. And what the research shows is when the environment is stable, when the climate is stable, we get bigger and bigger and bigger over time uh, as, as animals because that's the competitive advantage. But when the environment changes dramatically, it's the smaller, more nimble creatures that survive because they can find shelter, because they can forage for food, because they can reproduce more quickly than a two-ton wombat can. And so those big lumbering animals die out. Now, what's interesting here is the very thing that was your competitive advantage in a stable environment becomes your liability when the environment changes. And the very thing uh, that, that caused uh, the smaller creatures to struggle becomes their competitive advantage in a changeable climate. And that's why they were able to survive and thrive. And I find this an interesting parallel between the natural world and the business world. And we're going to be touching on that a little bit. But there's one concept that I'd like to run through. So you have to excuse me. I talk quickly and I keep moving quickly because I like to pack as much in as possible. So uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to speak as uh, slowly as possible, but that's a challenge for me. Um, exploiting and exploring. Now, all organizations are doing both of these things. Some are doing more of one, some are doing more of the other. But I just want to explain this concept. Right? Lots of people use various different types of uh, ways to explain the, the case for agility, be it Kinevin or, or whatever. This is over the years, what I found resonates with lots of people. If you are exploiting as an organization, you are optimizing a proven product and service, a proven and established business model. So these processes are understood, it's planable, it's predictable, you know what you're doing because you largely did it last year and you just need to do it a bit better now. It's about incremental improvements to your products and services. It's about reducing costs, increasing efficiency. So if you think about a pharma company, um, they have a drug that's already licensed, is already on the market, they've patented it. What they need to do is manufacture that drug as cheaply as possible, right? Just churn loads out. They need to package it, they need to distribute it, they need to market it. These are all known activities, predictable activities. Nothing new there. It's about being a little bit better each year. So that's exploit, right? And organizations do that very well. Then we have explore on the other side, on the right there. This is about creating new products, new services, new business models, right? And it's about creation of things that don't exist. It is highly unpredictable, highly experimental. You will fail a lot, right? It's about doing new things. So in the, in the pharma industry, 
Um, you need to explore about 25,000 compounds just to get 25 of those into clinical trials, of which about five on average will make it to market, of which about one on average will be a blockbuster that will pay lots and lots of money. So if you're not comfortable with failure, sorry, you're going to fail 24,990 odd times um, for every time you succeed. Uh, so uh, you better get comfortable with that. It's a very, very different mode of operation. On the left is about efficiency. On the right is about agility, right? It's a very, very different activity. I just want to dive into this a little bit more because I think this is vital for us to understand. Here is a great example of exploiting with efficiency, right? This is um, the Model T, which was the uh, car of the century or car of that century. This is the 20th century. And back in the 20th century, organizations survived and thrived through being experts at exploiting. The Model T was made for 19 years. Now, what was special about the Model T? Nothing particularly. What was special about it was how it was created. It was introduced in 1909, but it wasn't until 1913 that they changed the way they made it. Uh, and the innovation here uh, was they went from having the car in the middle and everyone running around getting stuff, assembling the car, to a moving assembly line. This was a dramatic operational innovation, which transformed production and, and car assembly. Right, just a few metrics about the Model T. It, it, was, uh, it was a 12 hour operation to assemble one and it retailed at $850 back in 1913. Right? After December, 1913, when they implemented it, that 12 hours became 90 minutes. And that $850 became $300, right? That is almost two thirds wiped off the retail price. No wonder they thrived and hoovered up the market. And by 1927, one in every two cars sold was a Model T, which is interesting given they only made it in black. I uh, can imagine how easy it was to find your car in a car park back then with a black Model T ocean around you, but that's a whole different problem, all right? And um, to put that in perspective, that is like selling, uh, in the UK at least, the, uh, the Model X Tesla sells for 80, 85,000 pounds. Imagine if that got dropped to 35 to 30,000 pounds, where you can imagine what would happen for the demand. And many, many big companies became incredibly successful because they were built around efficient operations. Right? And they, they, they exploited their current products and services incredibly well, and that's how they succeeded. Right? And so it, the way we design our organizations, the way we lead our organizations is all about worshiping at the altar of efficiency because for that century at least, or at least the first two thirds of it, that was how you succeeded. I'm not gonna dive too deeply into this, but suffice to say the world changed around us. The stable business climate where economies of scale, economies of scope and size was your competitive advantage in the same way that the asteroid changed the environment and swung the, uh, the advantage towards the small creatures, well, VUCA does exactly the same in the business climate, in volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. The world changes more quickly than it's ever changed before. The world is less predictable than it's ever been before. There's more interconnection than there's ever been before and complexity and moving parts. And of course, ambiguity is about our inability to get a handle on what's going on. Multiple interpretations on the data we have all seem valid at the time. We didn't know which one's right. So it's harder to make predictions. There's more interconnection and there's more volatility. This makes planning a nightmare. And, uh, and so this emergence of VUCA, and I think you know, many, many, many uh, contributors to this, but you know, increased technology, interconnectedness, uh, deregulation, reduced barriers to entry, all contributed towards this. Sorry. A few graphs coming up. If you are allergic to graphs, look away now. All right, but um, in terms of volatility, right, the years to reach 25% of the US population, right? So I'm comparing like for like here, took 46 years for electricity, smartphones took four years. Now I don't have the census data, but informal research shows me that smart speakers have done this even more quickly than all of these. So you can see the trend is definitely in one direction. New technologies are adopted far more quickly than ever before. And the years to reach $1 billion market capitalization is what we would call a unicorn. Uh, so typically 20 years for the Fortune 500 companies. Those slow bees, Google, took eight years to get there. Come on, do better, folks. Uh, and then suddenly you got WhatsApp, um, uh, Oculus Rift, Jet.com, four months. 
here's what these two graphs would say to me if I were running a major organization that was incredibly successful. You may have a technology you've never heard of being leveraged by an organization that doesn't yet exist, probably in someone's garage. It always seems to be in a garage, right? That could be the thing that disrupts your organization. And that's not gonna happen over the next 10 or 15 years. That could happen in two to three years. Just think about how the revenue of the telcos fell off a cliff when WhatsApp was introduced, right? They didn't have warning. They didn't have the same level of warning that Kodak had for digital photography and even they didn't manage to pivot, right? Fujifilm, however, did. And we can talk about that later. Um, but um, as I'm saying here, so th there are the ability to predict what's gonna happen is, is, is lower than ever possible. And in that sense, VUCA itself has changed the game. It's changed the climate from predictable, planable, where exploiting with efficiency was your competitive advantage, and, and so was economies of scale, to a world that is unpredictable, unplanable, and actually it's about doing new things now. And just to see the impact of that, this is the third and final graph, I promise. All right, um, so the average tenure on the S&P 500 index. When you joined the S&P 500 index in 1960, you could expect to be there for 61 years on average without doing a whole load of innovation. Now that's dropped to 15 years. Why? Because every product, every service, every business model has a shelf life. And that shelf life has got shorter and shorter and shorter. So you not only need to master exploiting, you need to master exploring new products and services and business models as well, because your current ones are going to expire in a shorter time than ever before. And the problem for most leaders and most organizations is they are designed for the stuff on the left almost exclusively. They might have like one or two skunk works labs, right? But they really don't commit to the right side. And we, and on our MBAs and our traditional business training and most organizational structures and designs are optimized for the left. That's because that was always successful in the 20th century, not always, right? But whenever a company was successful, they designed themselves like that. And we design ourselves like that today and we wonder why it doesn't work because it, it threatens our ability to explore and to innovate. And so for me, business agility is about being an ambidextrous organization. It's about excelling at what you do today and having the agility to create new innovative products and services and business models to respond quickly, easily, and cheaply to a market that changes very quickly around us. And unfortunately for most leaders, traditional culture structures and policies do not work when you're trying to explore. So you can be incredibly efficient. Blockbuster was incredibly efficient at operations. It just couldn't innovate. Neither could Kodak, neither could BlackBerry, neither could Nokia, and that was why they disappeared, not because they were incompetently managed. So that's the context for business agility. Um, this is a quote from a, a friend and, uh, and mentor of mine who, who we lost uh, um, tragically before his time uh, two or three years back now. But he always used to say this, it's easier to grow a unicorn than to transform a dinosaur. Like, what does he mean by that? Well, unicorn, of course, $1 billion market cap company. If you look at how many of those are emerging each year, it's a lot. If you look at how many big organizations that were traditionally organized that have transformed themselves to be agile, innovative organizations, well, you can probably count them on one hand and you wouldn't need all of your fingers, right? Uh, and so in a sense, Mike was right here. However, we're in the business <laughs> of helping dinosaurs to transform, or at least I am, right? I wish I were in the business of growing unicorns, then I could be on the beach right now. Um, but uh, we are about helping organizations to transform. So let's look at some of the patterns now. And this is where I'm gonna bring the six enablers in. So, why most organizations fail. Actually, before I do that, because I've just talked at you for a while, I want you, hopefully you didn't see that, you weren't supposed to see that. Um, I want you to, to throw in the chat now, why, why have you seen organizational transformations fail? What have been the barriers? Just get some, uh, get your typing fingers going if you can. Just uh, throw some stuff in there. What is the reason behind big organizations failing to transform? <laughs> I make no comment on that first one, but, uh, yeah, uh, Ethan, you might have a point there. Fear. We'll talk about that. What exactly people are fear, uh, fearful of. Leaders not leading. Um, yeah, uh, interesting. Sticking to a plan. This is fine if it's the right plan, right? 
bureaucracy, lack of alignment, structures. Yeah, all of these things, right? And it's funny when uh, when you kind of, when you when you get people to brainstorm, I can't even keep up with this lack of vision, budgets. Yeah, you get the idea, right? When I get people to to come up with these things, so there's there's never a lack of uh, of knowledge about what tr what prevents these transformations from succeeding. And then when we go into a transformation, we keep doing all of these things we know are going to block us. It's quite interesting. <laughs> Agile coaches that only know software and that only know you know insert your framework of choice here scrum kanban safe less uh whatever it is right so uh yeah the limitations of agile coach is uh one of the motivations i think for uh, for, for moving into this path so uh so uh so thank you uh for that uh always nice to see that everyone has the same problems wherever you are in the world i think i see the comforting or or, or soul destroying i'm not sure here's what i think some of the main issues are and i'll, I'll go through these lack of commitment now, really, why don't leaders commit to doing this? Well, there are a number of reasons, but actually, if you think about it rationally from their perspective, why on earth would they? Because they are incentivized for short-term returns. How do you maximize short-term returns? You focus on your current products and services and business models, and you squeeze more revenue out of them. You cut your R&D budget. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be uh, reviewed on the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, who cares about innovation that will sustain you in five years time, right? So being more efficient at what you do now is an easy way to boost your share price. Um, and of course, going through a big messy transformation is a risky endeavor. The safe thing to do, safe, not capitals, uh, the safe thing to do is nothing, right? The risky thing to do is to transform your organization, right? But in the long term, it's the necessary thing to do. So unless you have the backing of the board of directors, it's very difficult and I don't blame these leaders who don't commit. Number two, we're gonna look at a too narrow a focus. And I think some of you touched on that there, right? Focusing only on software development or one particular process practice framework. Let's dive into number two a little bit because it's really the context for everything we're talking about here. Here's how I describe this. If I tried to install an Android app on my iPhone, it wouldn't work. Of course it wouldn't work. Why on earth would that work? It's nothing wrong with the Android app, I, I, I imagine. I'm sure they're very good. I don't use the Android apps, but I've heard they're very good. Um, there's nothing wrong with, the, with iOS. What's wrong is the compatibility issue. There is a lack of compatibility between those things and it's going to fail. So how about this? If we install our trendy new ways of working, our processes, practices, frameworks, tools on our traditional organizational cultures, structures, policies, yeah, that won't work either, right? You see, oh, but Google do this and it works really well. Yes, that's because they're designed for it, right? You in your big uh, bureaucratic retail bank, not so much, right? Oh, if we can just call our team squads, everything will be fine. And uh, just let, we just haven't configured Jira properly, right? But you see this all the time. They're, they're addressing these things that just don't matter. And what they've failed to do is to create the organizational operating system for agility. So really what I think they're working on here is ways of working. I call ways of working processes, practices, frameworks, tools, technologies, right? All of these things incredibly important. I you know, make a living teaching a lot of these things. I don't knock them, right? But in every single one of my Scrum classes, I say, yes, we're learning about Scrum here. Unless somebody is creating the environment for this to work, the organizational operating system for these things to work, they will not work. And what do I mean by the organizational operating system? Well, over the years, I've narrowed it down to these things. And there have been so many iterations. I was looking back at a, a version of this, of this from, um, from 2014. That's how long it's been in the, uh, uh, in the making. And, uh, and a, lot, a lot of these things were here, as were a whole bunch of other things. And, and I've evolved it over the years. Right? But, but we're going to go these, through these things because actually those other five are what actually count. And as a leader, we need to make reasonably effective decisions in these areas to allow these ways of working to work. We need to create that operating system. And that's what the six enablers is about. Actually, it's about five of those enablers being the enablers and then the sixth one really being the ways of working that we install on top of it, right? And so we're gonna run through that because it's so often ignored in most agile literature. Um, so I can't go through these in any depth at all, but what I will do is just give you a flavor of why they're here, right? We all know, and again, you, you wrote these in the comments, that the leadership styles and management styles, and I'm, I'm bringing these things together, they're, they're slightly different things, but let's, let's assume they're not for now, right? 
We all know the challenges with this from the command and control, micromanagement, positional authority, uh, focusing on the work being done. We know that that could work well back in the day when Frederick Winslow Taylor was working in the Midvale factory in Philadelphia, and he was trying to get people to overhaul boilers more efficiently. Yes, in that stable environment, that can work. Right? But in today's fast moving, fast paced, high VUCA environment where we're trying to innovate, that falls, that just fails spectacularly. Now think of a football team um, and think of one team that's allowed to make in the moment decisions based on context and skill and one that has to ask their manager for every single time they make a pass or make a run. Like you can tell, I don't need to tell you which one would win there, right? Because you need to decentralize that decision-making. So for me, leaders go first, right? They need to change how they show up. They need to change their mindset before anything else changes to articulate that inspiring vision. They need to invest in growing others around them and they need to decentralize decision-making. Call this servant leadership, catalyst leadership, whatever kind of leadership you want to call it, intent-based leadership. Right? The military has known about this for years right? uh, and we need to change our leadership styles. Managers and leaders need to go on the journey first and foremost. If that doesn't change, almost nothing else will. So I put that one first and I always cover it first. Next comes culture. And again, like don't, don't be surprised. These things are not mutually exclusive, right? That you, there are things that could appear in each of these, right? Leadership affects culture, as do our uh, sort of HR policies. So, you know, I, I separate these because otherwise I just have one big blob. It's incredibly complex and interconnected. So again, we're looking at moving away from control, conformity, fear, secrecy, blame. Oh, you've probably seen this, right? The bureaucratic organizations. Um, a way to, to something that is about trust and transparency, openness, where we have psychological safety and the ability to experiment freely, where we're not blaming and pointing fingers and setting ourselves up to uh, cover our backsides the whole time, right? where we can actually do uh, good things. right? But that is a cultural change that needs to happen. An organizational culture, by the way, is uh, almost always number one on the list of impediments on the uh, version one state of Agile report, or in the top three at least. Now, people often ask me, how do you change culture? Well, firstly, you don't change culture, just like you don't change a shadow on the wall directly, unless you're Peter Pan, where most people aren't, right? So how do you do that? Well, you, you change whatever is making that, that, that shadow. So the light source or the object. And it's the same with culture. Culture is a result of the behaviors in the organization, which again, you can't directly control. But you've got five levers you can pull on to directly change that will change the behaviors that will change the culture. And, I call, and, they, and I've identified those five leaders as structures, policies, incentives, metrics, and leadership behaviors, how you show up as a leader, right? So you change the way you structure your teams, you change the rules that govern the organization, how it works, the incentives and the metrics you track and the leadership behaviors, that will lead to behavioral change, which will lead to culture change. It's, it's, a, it's a result, not something that you can directly control. But we've got to be focusing on this. And so many, even people who know this is important, ignore this in a transformation. Now, from something you can't directly control to something you can directly control, which makes structure incredibly powerful. Now, you design your teams and your organizations for a particular attribute, right? Whether that's efficiency, whether that's maximizing utilization, whether that's agility and cycle time. Just like you design a car for a certain attribute, right? You design a big spacious car for a family, or you have a sporty little number that's gonna help you go through a mountain pass in Switzerland, they're designed for different things and you shouldn't expect one to be good at the other. Like an oil tanker versus a speedboat, right? So you know, if you've got top-down hierarchies, silos, individual productivity, right? You, you might get efficiency, you might be good at exploiting, but you will suck at exploring because you won't be collaborative enough because you won't get fast enough feedback because the teams just won't work together. And we all know the power of the, the cross-functional autonomous team and the networks of those interconnected teams, the team of teams, if you've read Stanley McChrystal's work, that are autonomous and customer focused, working towards a common goal. That is a different organizational structure. So when you end up with is kind of a traditional structure on the exploit side and a more network-based team of team structure on the explore side, we call that an ambidextrous organizational structure with a level connecting them to make sure that they are aligned and able to access and share resources and capabilities. Organizational design is a big piece. Uh, there's a lot of literature around it. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. I've got 15 minutes left. I think we'll be all right. 
people and engagement. This is what we would call HR, right? HR almost always gets forgotten. It makes me so sad. I go into an organization that is going through a transformation uh, and HR barely even know it's going on. And you think how on earth with traditional, strictly defined job roles, um, with individual incentives over team-based incentives, with one that is more about bureaucracy and compliance and rules and dress code and holiday policies and all of this nonsense, which is not value add, right? When actually what really gets people going is trust, freedom, recognition, growth, psychological safety, recognition, all of these things that lead to high engagement, right? And, and, and if you've read the state of uh, the global workplace report by Gallup, you'll see 15% of people engaged at work. These are the people who drive performance, who innovate, who, who, who make the difference in your organization, right? And we've got 85% of people not in that space. Right. And that is a direct result of how we design our organizations, not the individuals that you hire. Right. So our HR policies need to be reinvented to be fit for the 21st century. Governance and funding raises eyebrows and we'll say, what well, governance and funding? Yeah, because like like HR, we need to bring finance along for the ride, too. Why? Because finance often own the governance side of things. And if you have upfront business cases with a fixed scope and you've got to deliver against the plan, you know, I was a project manager and I remember being told, you just got to deliver on scope, on budget, on time. No one ever said the product needed to be any good, right? No one ever said that the customer had to like it. It's just, well done, you did what you said you were going to do. But so what, all right? And so these, uh, these, these rigid plans, predefined outputs, if you have a governance policy that means you have to do, and it's the number one question I get in my scrum classes, where I talk about inspecting and adapting at the sprint review, and people say, yeah, but we've got a fixed scope. And I was like, well, then don't bother having a sprint review because it's, it's literally pointless because the point is to get feedback from your stakeholders and then to change what you do based on that. If you don't change what you do based on that, we're saying, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea to do something else because our feedback, yeah, we're not going to do that though. Pointless. All right. So if you don't transition towards small, safe to fail experiments, adaptive plans. All right. So uh, as you learn, I think it was Don Reinertsen that said it, right? If uh, to, to carry on the, uh, down, down a road, even though it no longer represents your best economic interests, is the act of a fool. As you learn, you respond to that learning and you focus on business outcomes, not outputs. And you focus on products, not projects. Right? And, and I think this is a big change. Uh, in, in organizations who are used to this traditional project management approach of what am I going to get? When am I going to get it? How much is it going to cost? But we can't be that specific with innovation. Okay, so we absolutely need to reinvent how we do governance and how we invest our money, right? Instead of trying to pick the one or two winners, run a bunch of experiments, engage in design thinking, kill the ones that don't work, double down on the ones that do. There's a bunch of interesting stuff you can do in this space. And finally, the thing that we spend most of our time on in so-called agile transformations. This is where we implement Scrum or Kanban or Jira or uh, user stories or design thinking or whatever it is your, your practice, right? But as you can see, those things are only going to work if you've done the other five things well. If you haven't, these things will be blocked at every single turn. You'll have project managers micromanaging the team. You'll have a fixed scope. You have a team that's not cross-functional because the testing team's over here. You'll have like, it's just, no, you've seen all these dysfunctions, I'm sure. I've seen them more times than I ever want to see them. So again, moving away from these rigid processes, documentation, standardization, and moving towards the stuff on the right that you can see there, right? Just collaboration, fast feedback, uh, making the work visible and allowing people to own how they work and to, uh, to continuously improve how they work. So they're the six enablers. As you can see, if you only focus on one or two of them, you, you're likely to struggle. And, and this has been my frustration over the years. This is why the model is in existence, because people just weren't aware of the scope of the change. And, and that's leading to shallow organizations. Right? So that's number two, too narrow a focus. Um, I'm going to go through these reasonably quickly now because number two was, was the main one that the talk's about. Um, I want to touch on number three. As you can see, right, we want to change how leaders show up. We want to change the culture and the structures and the policies and the HR and the finance. Well, that's not going to happen bottom up as much as we would love to think that it would. Uh, your, your, your tester is not going to reinvent your governance policy. If they do, please let me know. I'd love to read that case study. I, I've never seen that happen. This is, a, this is the most senior leadership. Now, you can look at any successful transformation, be it Stanley McChrystal at JSOC, 
uh, in it, described in his book, Team of Teams, be it David Marquet in his uh, USS Santa Fe, described in, in his uh, wonderful book, um, Turn the Ship Around, be it Satya Nadella at Microsoft, be it Ricardo Semler at Semco, I mean, I could go on, right? Um, the thing they have in common is it's driven from the very top. Bottom up, absolutely, there's support bottom up, but the big structural changes come from the top. They can only come from the top. And actually it needs to go beyond the CEO and the board need to support this and the board need to recognize the importance of business agility and innovation as well. Because if, you, if the board doesn't have your back as a CEO, you won't last very long and you won't commit. And that will be that number one again. All right, so the wrong people leading the change. When I see oh, the, the development managers driving this, I think, oh dear, uh, there's, going to be a, there's going to be a glass ceiling here uh, that we won't be able to smash through. All right, so uh, we have to be careful about who drives this change. Four and five, I want to touch on quickly now in the last, uh, uh, in the last few minutes because lack of alignment and a lack of a coherent approach. We need to all understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, right? Start with why, Simon Sinek told us that was important years ago, all right? So we need to understand the vision. What is it we're trying to achieve? What problem are we trying to solve here? And by the way, the answer isn't we need to be more agile, right? How, that's a, a means to an end, but we should really understand what the, what the end is. And a lack of coherent approach, I've seen this, people make a bunch of changes in various parts of the organization, which is good because they've got beyond the IT department. However, how do we know they're aligned? How do we know they're coherent? Everything needs to hang together and move us forward. And if we can't see everything in one place, it becomes incredibly difficult to see how everything hangs together. Um, someone who solved this problem for business models is a guy called Alex Osterwalder. And he created a canvas which allowed you to see how each of the nine components of the business model hang together and interact with each other in a coherent way. That's literally why the business model canvas exists. I, and, and I'm a big fan of that and I've used it a lot. And I thought, well, why don't we just do the same for our transformation? Why don't we see how all of the elements of the transformation hang together? We can get alignment and we can get coherence. Um, so I created something called the Business Agility Canvas. Yes, a complete rip off of the Business Model Canvas, although I found it to be quite useful. So here's how it works. We start with why and what, all right? What are we trying to achieve? We then look at the how, and then we look at the what else, because I can't think of a name that's as interesting as the first two there. So help me out if you can think of a better name than what else. Now, I'll go through this super quickly now. Um, this is the Business Agility Canvas, which you can download for free, plus a 20-page guidebook if you think this is something that might uh, be useful to your organization. Um, vision, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, values, what do we value as an organization? Success criteria, yes, there needs to be something that we track to show we're better than we were, rather than, I think we've improved, right? We do need to have a little bit of discipline about what are we tracking? What are our success metrics, right? We should do that whatever goals we have. If it's not measurable, it's very difficult to know. So we need something, even if it's uh, some qualitative assessment, we need to have some success criteria. Have the changes we made resulted in improvements against our vision? Then we have the how. Notice how this is the six enablers of business agility. Now, another, another tool I've borrowed from here is the V2MOM, vision, values, methods, obstacles, measures. So you can see vision and values is in there, um, obstacles is in there, um, uh, measures is in there. Now the methods I struggled with, so this comes from Mark Benioff at Salesforce, the, 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 the methods I struggled with because as you can see, there's a whole bunch of areas that we need to make changes in. And what I found was we were missing whole sections, whole enablers. So I've just split, it, split that out into the six enablers um, and there they all are. Culture lies across everything because everything influences the culture. But we need to stick post-its on here that are coherent. What are we doing? This is high level stuff, right? So it might just be, you know, find a leadership development program uh, that we can put our leaders through. It might be create one product where we can create cross-functional teams and a network. It might be start reviewing some of our HR policies, whatever it might be, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff you need to do in there based on what we've just talked about. And finally, we have the what else? Partners and stakeholders, right? Who's gonna help us? Who's gonna train us? Who's gonna guide us? What about our suppliers? Who else needs to be involved in this journey? Do we have them on board? Key risks, what could go wrong? And believe me, there's a lot that could go wrong. Key obstacles, what's in the way right now? You remember from, uh, from John Cotter's work, not removing obstacles to progress is one of the reasons that we fail in organizational transformations. So the leadership should be addressing those obstacles and removing those obstacles, 
and getting them out of the way. So we need to have transparency around that. Uh, and so that's the business agility of Canvas. And um, it is designed to, to, uh, to deal with all five of these things, right? We commit to what we're trying to achieve and why it's important. We don't focus on just one enabler. We focus on all of them. We've got the senior leadership driving the change. We have alignments and we have coherence between all of these things. And so uh, and I'm a big fan of that. Print it out as big as you can. Get all the senior leadership team around there, sticking post-its on it, review it frequently. That's going to help with alignment and communication there. So, uh, or something similar that helps you uh, make sure you don't have any gaps. Okay, to, to summarize now, it's quarter to the hour. Um, so business agility is how we survive and thrive in a high VUCA environment. Like when the world changes around you, being good at what you do is great until what you do becomes irrelevant. So if you're not able to create the new, now think about Amazon, right? They're, they are the best example of an ambidextrous organization. They have one of the most profitable, successful retail operations on the planet. When I say one of, the, right? But they are still relentless in creating new products and services. Right? They created an e-reader called the Kindle. They created smart speakers, the Echo, powered by Alexa. They almost single-handedly invented cloud computing with Amazon Web Services, a $50 billion organization in its own right. They never stay still. Right? And you see so many organizations that think that their product and service is going to last forever. We're actually here to say that that won't happen. And in order to create that business agility, in order to survive and thrive, you need to focus on all six of those enablers. You can't just focus on ways of working, processes, practices, frameworks, tools. You need to go broader and you need to create that environment, not across the whole organization initially, take one product and service and separate them and change the culture and the structures and the governance policies just for that small group if you want to take a conservative approach to this. And that's gonna depend on your culture, but you can't ignore any of those things. And finally, yeah, you, need a, you need some coherence, right? Coherent, coordinated, consciously designed changes that are driven by senior leadership and owned by senior leadership who committed to doing this. Right? And that's how uh, you're gonna set yourselves up for success. That and a whole bunch of other stuff, I'm sure. Um, again, another freebie, uh, I'll send you a link. There's a bunch of free resources you can, you can download, but this is the, the very high level assessment. Just three questions per enabler. Six times three is 18, last time I checked. All right, so super quick uh, ass uh, assessment of how you're doing. You can see this organization is struggling on its governance and funding. That is a typical place where people don't uh, really spend that much time. Uh, so uh, you can check out the uh, self-assessment. Um, you can check this out as well. I go significantly deeper in, in here. Um, so uh, this is what this was my labor and lo of love over the first lockdown. Uh, it is now out. It was out in, uh, in early June. So uh, feel free to check that out. If you visit sixenablers.com and I'll, uh, uh, I'll ping the link out. You can see it up there at the top there. Uh, you'll find a bunch of free resources. Uh, you'll find a, uh, an assessment around employee engagement and a whole bunch of other things which people have found useful all for free. So uh, check those out. A um, couple of minutes over, but uh, that's not the biggest deal in the world. Thank you so much for coming and listening. And uh, I, I really uh, uh, look forward to continuing this discussion in the Q&A. But uh, that is all I wanted to say for the presentation. So uh, thank you so much, folks. Hey, well, everyone, would you like to thank Karim? <laughs> I'm a bit blown away by that. That was fantastic. Derek. Excellent. So, uh, so we're moving into Q and A. Uh, so, to confirm, can I get you to uh, add your questions to the chat, and I'll pick them up. If there's a, uh, a, a I guess a double up, I'll I'll try to consolidate where I can. Uh, but we do have some questions which were uh, dropped during the session. So, uh, this was actually at the start of the session. I think it was actually from Ethan. So, which framework is best for business agility, Karim? Yeah. So, so for me, so hope, hopefully the kind of the question has, has answered itself really. Like if you don't address the other five enablers, um, none of them will work. All right. So that, that's the first thing I'll say. If you have addressed the other five enablers, any of them can work, right. But you'll, but you'll need a, com you'll need a combination, right. So early in the process, you should be investing in things like design thinking, right. So that you can quickly, easily, and cheaply test and validate new business and product ideas. So design thinking, I'm a big fan of. And then when you're building out those ideas, Scrum, 
large scale scrum, even safe to be honest, because you can do safe well and you can do it badly. Um, that can work. Now the thing about safe and where I do give it some praise is it's if you have a certain type of culture, right? What I would call a control culture, they have a very conservative attitude to transformation and therefore safe as your starting point is about the only one that won't get rejected outright. Like I'm, a, I'm a less trainer, right? Large scale scrum, I'm a big fan of it. I know in most organizations, if you try and introduce that in day one, you will be invited to, the, to, to, to see the door, right? So um, for me, you, you know, the, the, the framework itself is, is, is less relevant, but the organization's approach to change and how quickly you change is, is one thing to ponder. And, and if you've got the environment in place, any of those will work well and can work well. Um, the one thing I will say is less is about the only framework for product development which addresses some of the other enablers, right? And, and you know, my, my, influence, my thinking has been influenced deeply by Craig Larman over the years. Uh, it, it addresses governance, it addresses structures, it addresses leadership. Uh, every single one of those enablers, less has an answer for. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, less is gonna make your life easier, but really any of those things will work if you create the right underlying organizational operating system, even safe. There we are. Excellent. So we have a question from uh, Naranjan. Uh, so can you share real life examples for budgeting the agile way? Oh yeah. So I, I've actually, so this, this was a kind of what opened my eyes to this back in 2014, 15, I was working as part of a transformation at, at Barclays bank based in the UK. And that bank is 330 years old. All right. So this is not a, a Monzo style startup. Um, this is an organization that was about as conservative as it comes. And what they realized is the first two times they tried to transform it failed because, of course, big upfront business cases. And then we funded the next 18 months worth of projects and that can't change. It's like, well, how do we have agility in that context? And um, the third time around, they addressed it. Now, what I will say is they kept two separate governance processes, the software development life cycle, which was your traditional approach with a business case and a project plan, and what they called lean control, which was, and actually this worked incredibly well because, and it's, it sounds really simple, but what more do you need? Um, you identify a product. In this case, it was a corporate banking product we were working on, had five teams associated with it. Do we need a bunch of projects or do we just need to fund that product so that those five teams um, are there and then put an empowered product owner to deliver value constantly. And every quarter we track progress against OKRs, objectives and key results. And we decide, have we delivered as much value as we wanted? Have we hit the business outcomes we want to hit? And then every quarter we can scale up, give them more teams or scale down, take teams away and give it to another product that's more worthy. Uh, and in that sense, all of the upfront business cases went away, all the project plans went away, and we just continually flowed value. That's all it was, it was continuous product development. And then the governance process is what? Each quarter we just review. Um, and so, yes, I've seen that happen and I've seen it incredibly simplify all of this planning process they do each year, which is painful for everyone. And all of that stuff went away. Uh, and I've seen that happen. Um, there's also a bunch of great examples around beyond budgeting. You wanna look at the beyond budgeting roundtable. They've got a bunch of great examples as well. Uh, but yes, it happens. Um, so, uh, in, and it's great to see. I, I, if anyone else has examples, I'd love to hear of those too. Uh, so we've got another question from Nar Naranjan in regards to uh, biz the business agility canvas. So uh, Naranjan, are you, if you're still on the line, can you, um, can you chime in there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, referring to the business agility canvas, so we, we talked about populating that, you know, with the team or with the organization to achieve an outcome. But while doing that, um, should uh, the agile manifesto be our guideline? Like, you know, that's our guiding star. Uh, and we look at those values and principles, and then we assess ourselves. And that's how you we put in uh, our, you know, points on the on that canvas. Like what should we compare against uh, while filling that canvas with our teams? That's an interesting point. I've, do you know, I've never done that and I've never considered doing that because really what you want to do is design a bunch of changes that will move you towards your vision. Now, in the line of work we're in, that vision is almost always uh, some kind of 
increased agility to in order to innovate in order to create products that customers love more and to do that we need agility right so in that sense it always ends up being how can we respond to change over following a plan how can we uh, value individuals interactions over processes and so forth? that ends up happening almost automatically but you know like, like everything it wouldn't hurt to have that as your guiding light as you run through this um, because it's easy to it's easy to get hung up on processes and tools as we see. Um, so uh, I haven't done that, but I, I think it's a great idea, and, and you could definitely could do that as you're you know, just checking back. Hey, folks, is is this aligned with with the values and principles of the manifesto? And if not, are we okay with that? I, I like that, but I've never done it myself. So uh, thank you for that. Nice. So we've got another a question from uh, Sashi. So if a big organization wants to bring agility, what's your view while trying with a small team versus going agile across the organization? My, my view is obviously depends on the size of the organization, right? If it's, if it's kind of, I'm going to assume a big organization, bigger than, um, bigger than a few thousand, um, then uh, I like the I like the less guideline, large scale Scrum guideline of go narrow and deep over broad and shallow. I've always found broad and shallow is like trying to boil the ocean, right? You're trying to change. You know, the Barclays had over 100,000 people. They were never going to do everyone. However, you take one product, right? So it can be one team, it can be five teams, it can be seven teams, as long as they're collaborating on one product. Um, and you say, we are going to do it well for this one product. Everyone else stay as you are. So you get a bunch of people, you form cross-functional teams, network of interconnected teams, you get an exemption from standard governance, and that's not trivial, but you call it an experiment, you get away with things a lot more than if you say we want to make a change. Um, um, and then you change, so you, you, you work differently in terms of governance, you try and change the culture and leadership and structures, and it helps if you're a bit separated, and you get it working end to end there. Right? As in actual value flowing through the system, and you, you tackle all six enablers for that one product. Then when you demonstrate value, it's much easier to roll out. And of course you won't make the same mistakes over and over again, you hope, you learn from your mistakes. Uh, and so I would always value going narrow and deep, uh, whether it's one product, you can, sorry, one, one team or multiple teams on the same product, demonstrate it with a limited blast radius and then implement it across the organization incrementally. It's been my, it's been my experience um, over the years. And I think that that plays into what Craig and Buss talk about with less too. So Dave had a question on exploring the, the business agility space. So uh, he was keen to ask is what book would you recommend in, in the space apart from your, your own? <laughs> um, so before I answer, and I know it's, it's a cheat, but I will answer the question in a sec. Um, on sixenablers.com, there is, there is a condensed reading list from every chapter of the book. Yeah. Um, and so there's one for leadership, agility, so leadership management, there's one for governance and funding, there's one for structure. Um, and so you, you'll get my views of what you should read in each of those areas and you can download that for free. So there's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, you know, my, my favorite book on business agility, um, I think uh, I, any, I, I'll, I'm gonna put two or three out, sorry, I, I can't just put one out. Um, I, I would read Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal, which I guess technically isn't about business agility, but it is. Um, and it covers so much of that stuff um, around operating in, in high uncertainty and leadership styles and structures. And, uh, and it's just also a really interesting tale. The politics of the war aside, it's an interesting tale uh, of how defeating Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, happened. Um, so I'd read Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. Um, I would read um, Humanocracy by Gary Hamill, which is a reasonably recent book, uh, but it talks about um, humanocracy. Uh, versus bureaucracy. All right, so um, uh, I check that one out. Um, and the other one is I'd read um, The Age of Agile by Steve Denning, um, who again is another person who's really talking about business agility beyond just IT and software development. And uh, all of those books are, are in the reading list that you can download there. But they'll be the, off the top of my head, they'll be the, the three that, uh, that I picked. Excellent. So um, Adrian, uh, if you're still on the, uh, on the call, uh, you had an example for the question before on budgeting. So you want to elaborate and share with the team? Sorry, with the group. Yeah, sure, we will do. Can you guys all hear me? Just a quick show. Sorry, I'm actually, I don't care. I'm in my PJs, guys, but I'm just... <laughs> and all these are the joys of working from home. Um, good old flannies are on now. Um, 
A real quick one from me. So in um, so working in a bank a while back, one of the things that we did, and you'll probably see this in all organisations you've worked in as well, competing priorities, yeah? We just couldn't get past the whole competing priority issue. And when you start diving deep into what was the source of that, it fundamentally came down to the way things were being um, budgeted for. So, uh, you know, every, every year budgeting cycle happens, funds are arbitrarily assigned to everybody and everyone tries to run their own agendas, their own projects, and the organisation was pulling itself apart at the seams. Um, so what we did from one year to the next, we literally got rid of everybody's budgets. It was that sim like, as simple as it sounds. Everyone had a core operating budget that you needed to run your team and, and keep the lights on. For any value add work, we created, there were three battlegrounds that we wanted to um, exploit or explore within the organization and created cross-functional teams across all functions of the organization um, that were assigned to each of those, or at least ahead to, to sort of, you know, to, to uh, spearhead that piece. Um, and if anyone ever wanted funding, basically created a Dragon's Den type approach where you'd work in your collaborative work groups and you had to go back to the leadership group um, and, and ask for money. You needed to have a, a, a you know, had pitches um, uh, through to running experiments, develop, like, you know, incremental funding based on, hey, we need this money to go and learn this thing and then we're going to come back to you in four weeks to ask for more money. Um, but it was the simplest way to a, enforce collaboration across the organization rather than people pulling apart into different directions. Um, and, and it got rid of the, the budgeting problem altogether. And I mean, this was a this was here in Australia, it was Ubank, it was uh, an organization of about 250 people, right? So small startup, you sort of scale, but um, you know, it, took, it didn't take long um, to fall into the traps of, of pulling apart as opposed to working together. Uh, and that's how we fixed it. I love that. Thanks for thanks for sharing, Adrian. I love hearing stories like that, especially in a bank. And uh, um, if you if you can combine that approach with design thinking and and testing your business ideas with with cheap MVPs, it becomes very powerful because you can say, you know what, you have this amount of money, just you can go off and spend to test an idea. If you want more, you come back and demonstrate with data that this is something worth pursuing. And in that sense, you run lots of small experiments and you kill most of them, right? But as you should, and then you double down on, I love that, thank you. So we have a question from Alison. So how do organizations who have introduced Agile uh, for a few years, whereas uh, embedded in a way they deliver, keep Agile fresh and current? People can sometimes get a bit stale, or forget how to work efficiently together. So, um, Alison, if you want to uh, elaborate, if there's anything else there? Um, not really. It's just that um, I think sometimes, you know, there's that kind of ramp up and excitement at the start where, you know, you're transforming um, delivery for an organisation. But, you know, over time, like say over, it's, a, it's an organisation I work for, over time, people start to get a bit complacent and, and you know, we're a remote workforce and so we're, we're never in the same room. Um, with our colleagues and you know we don't pretend to put video on so we don't you know see people's reactions we try to encourage that so that there's a the, you know a facial response and you know that type of thing so you know I'm looking for I guess you know keeping the actual organization agile in the sense that it's fresh um, and people are thinking all the time about or just reminding themselves I think perhaps about ways that they can continue to improve the way that they work together. Is there anything that you kind of think off the top of your head that would be would be could be a consideration of keeping it fresh? So it's it's I like what you said at the end. This just to continuously improve, right? Because you know, ultimately, yeah. you the most agile organisations almost never use that word, um, mm. because it's it's just how they work, mm. um, and so. You, you use that word with a big organization that, that doesn't have it. It's so like, hey, you need more agility. But once you have it, it's like, right now, how can we be better? Whatever better means to you. Um, and that comes from the leadership of the organization, right? Do you think things get stale um, at, at, uh, in, the, in the Fremont uh, assembly plant uh, where they make Teslas? Uh, do you think things get stale at, uh, in Seattle where, where uh, Bezos is walking the corridors? Um, almost not, almost certainly not. Um, and Satya Nadella as well, how he's reinvigorated Microsoft. And the reason is because leaders expect that of people to be constantly demonstrating improvement of their leadership, but of teams as well. And of course, you can't just expect improvement. You have to empower them to make the changes yeah. to, to improve. Otherwise, it's highly unfair. Right. Um, but, you know, you go back to the days of Toyota and Taichi Ono, and he was the same. There's a famous example of him coming back. 
and seeing a team's uh, way of working that hadn't changed for two months. Um, and the translation gets a little bit lost, but he said he accused them of being salary thieves, which you probably don't want to do. But he, because you know, he, he, in his mind, your job is to do your job and improve your job. Um, and and that culture has to be set from the top. If you know, if your leader comes and says, you know, one of the last three things you've done to be more effective as a team, you know, you better have an answer to that. And so it's easy to get stale when no one's looking, right? When no one's expecting you, yeah. no one's pressuring you to be better. But if you have that expectation on you embedded into your appraisals, embedded into how you, you get together each day, then you know, just focusing on being more effective is, is always going to result in that happening or mostly. So I would say it's a, it's a leadership and culture thing for me. Um, but I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear yeah. everyone else's thoughts on this because it's, it's an interesting one. So I'm I'm going to brush up on my uh, my katakana right now, and it's uh, Tomisu, and his question or more of a comment is is that the the misconception of agile is IT centric only needs to be addressed among business departments. So so Thomas, uh, is there anything more you want to elaborate on that, or or more of on the comment or the question? Or is it the question that, you know, is there a way to clarify that uh, in terms of what needs to be addressed? So what's your thoughts on that, Karim? My thoughts are that it almost always does need to be clarified, which is why, um, you know, uh, and a uh, sort of increasing amount of my work is, is running um, agile leadership or business agility uh, sessions, right? Be it Cal or, or similar. And, and I, I like every single member of the leadership team in the room, right? If HR is not there, if finance isn't there, then you're missing people who represent key enablers. And the message I'm giving in that session is A, business agility is vital and it's important. Um, and B, in order to achieve it, none of you are exempt from making changes to how you operate, right? You as finance need to support traditional operations. You also need to support the more innovative agile approaches as well. So what are you going to do to do that? Um, because you're right. If, if it just stays in, in IT, then, and, and this is precisely what the six enablers are trying to address. Like it is, it needs to get way beyond that. And the only way that happens is through senior leaders driving the change through, but really everyone understanding what it takes. You know, I can sign up to run a marathon, right? Easy peasy, right? But then when someone shows me the training regime, I might think, um, yeah, maybe not. Uh, maybe I'll just stick to a 5K, right? And, and, and I think before we go into this transformation, we need to be really clear. This is not just something we do with developers. This is something the whole organization needs to embrace or don't, right? And I think that message beforehand is, uh, is really important. And that's the message we're trying to give over and over again. So you're absolutely right. Um, how we communicate that, I think executive education um, before you do anything is vital. And then we make an informed decision to do it or not has been what I've seen work well. Excellent. So uh, we've uh, got to the point of our questions. I, I would like to open the floor to, to the group. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, ask Karim? Okay, so it's uh, eight past nine. Ron, over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, just like to thank Krim once more, really, because uh, yeah, he's doing this on his uh, own time in the middle of a work day in London there on a summer day. Uh, can we all thank Krim once again? Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. And great, great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. And the sun's come out in London. You'll be delighted to hear. So uh, uh, it might be temporarily sunnier here than in Sydney. So uh, I'll, I'll take that. Fantastic. And there's a yeah, number of resources, I guess, that Six Enablers website. It's a great one to check out. Uh, I thought what we might do is try to get this video posted and, and sent not just to the people that came tonight, but the whole Sydney Scrum user group at least uh, any other links or resources that you, you want to share, Karim? 
Um, so what was uh, No, I've consolidated that all. If you just click on resources on sixenables.com, it'll take you right down to, to where everything is. And uh, those are the main tools that, that I share with people right now. So uh, uh, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter, every now and then I'll share some, some different stuff. But um, um, no, it's all on there. So a uh, single link now, because I, I was sending so many things out, it just got out of hand. So uh, you'll find it there. That certainly makes it easy. Fantastic. And look, you're getting a whole lot of feedback. Uh, everyone's <laughs> pitching in there on chat there. So yeah, if I could uh, pass you a, a celebratory bottle, I'd, I'd do that. But <laughs> we're on the other side of the world and we really appreciate your time and energy uh, that you put into it tonight. And everyone that's come along tonight, thanks so much for those, qu those questions. I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, discussion there out of that. And uh, yeah, I'll certainly be finishing up Karim's book and I really recommend it. It's, it's a great read. Uh, do check it out thanks everyone that's all we've got for tonight it was wonderful to see you all along tonight um, don't have much planned for the next meetup but um, if anyone's got any proposal uh, anything you want to uh, suggest uh, I'll be on the call perhaps for another few minutes and um, happy to chat but otherwise thanks Karim thanks everyone thanks Derek You're welcome everyone thanks, thanks. thank you thank you really good see you, see you around maybe